Ladies and gentlemen, a warm welcome to everyone to today's discussion, which as billed is, is based on an insight into what we've called a, a colourful family scenario as to what can go wrong in generational planning. Now that's uh, tax and succession planning rather than town and country planning, but this is the first of a series of webinars and virtual roundtables in the pipeline, which like our rural business and estates team will cover areas from tax and trusts to property and planning, from business structures and, and financing to employment. Um, I'm James Pavey, for those of you who don't know me, and I head up the Rural Business and Estates team here at Owen Mitchell. Joining me today will be Kate Harris, who is an associate in the Wills, Will Trusts and Estates Dispute team. And as we tend to refer to it internally, she specializes in death, money and madness. James Laycock, who is a partner in the same team, who's based in our Leeds office. Andrew Parry, who is a tax, trusts and estates partner in the Reading office. I thank them and, and I thank you for joining us. From the, the delegate list, um, there's a very large number of you whom we know and in other circumstances we'd want to, uh, to come and have a coffee and a chat with afterwards. To those of you who we, we know less well, um, welcome. We hope that today gives you an insight into what our national rural business and estates team has at its fingertips and we hope to meet you in the the not too distant future if i can deal firstly with some some housekeeping if you'd like to ask questions during the course of the webinar then please submit them through the q a function on your screen and we will time permitting endeavor to answer as many of those as possible at the end of the the discussions which you're about to see We'll be recording the, the event and we will be sending the recording out afterwards. If there are, are any any sort of issues that, are, that, that interrupt the, um, the course of the event, technical issues, then we will either continue recording or, or re-record and send that out for you. So you'll have the complete um, discussion. You'll find a feedback survey in the Q&A box, so please do fill that in. We've allotted 75 minutes maximum, but if we've we finish sooner then, and you probably don't expect to hear this from a lawyer, less is more. And if there's a fire alarm, then I leave it to you to see whether the kitchen's burning down. Now, you had, I think, as a, as a by email, either yesterday or possibly this morning, a package of, um, of PDFs, which really set out the background to what we're going to talk to today. Um, those, for those who've not had a chance to, to, to read through them, what I'm going to do is spend just five minutes or so praising um, those. And it's a sort of a family scenario with, a, with, a, with an estate mapped around it. And I've got to thank James Laycock particularly for, for the, the fertile imagination of a litigator for having devised this for, for us today um, to follow and to talk about. Rereading it last night, I was I was wondering whether it was actually the proof for the first chapter of his first novel, a 21st century Jilly Cooper meets Tom Sharp. Um, but I hope we and we all hope that it'll be it's not an arid and sterile situation, but a rather more entertaining and memorable one on which to hang hang the hooks of some of the more serious legal points. So just if, if I can turn firstly, um, those of you who've got a computer and screen open in front of you, the, the, the family tree, the dramatis personae. The Fitzalan Brook family and the Fitzalan Brook estate, entirely fictional, in the county of Wentworthshire, which is definitely not South Yorkshire. Um, and the head of the family is, is Henry, um, who is father, husband, partner. Um, you can tell this has been written by a lawyer. It refers to the deceased. Um, his wife, Patricia, and their three children, Harvey, the eldest son, um, who's Monica is saucy, I think, to suggest licentious and a bit of a wastrel. James, Jammy, he always lands on his feet, the second son. And Georgie, Anne Fitzalan Brooke, the gaffer, which I think must be an allusion to the initials and that she's rather bossy. And there is a second, as it were, secret family, Kitty Longfling, the, uh, the long-standing partner, as we put it, of, of Henry, and, and a son by, by, by Kitty, Marshall. If we move on then to um, to what the family assets look like, the the estate runs to a, uh, runs to about three and a half thousand acres. There's 60 acres of, of pasture land surrounding um, a, a Georgian 
house, um, Mortimer's Hall. And, and on that 60 acres, there's also a commercial tomato growing operation. Henry, in terms of, of the non-property, real property assets, has about a quarter of a million pounds in, in bank and building societies, about four million pounds worth of, of, of stocks and shares, and a pension fund of about, about two million. The three farms, uh, two large arable farms, one smaller dairy farm, are farmed by the, the Fitzalan Brook Farming Partnership, which is unwritten, unincorporated and no, no LLP. Um, and he and his three children by, by, by his wife are the, are the partners of that. All the farms uh, are listed in the accounts with the part of machinery, um, but the legal title remains in Henry's in father's name. Each farm array of buildings and uh, as you'd expect and, 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 and residential property. Second son James works the dairy farm, doesn't do it for very much reward. He's turned down offers of employment elsewhere, but on the, on the basis really that he's had a promise that if he shows, turns his hand to it and does a good job, um, he will, you know, he'll, he'll get, get the farm and the cottage he's, he lives in and he's done up. The land on which the, uh, the commercial tomato growing, growing operation is based is, is in the wife's name. And the com commercial farming operation that the tomato growing operation is, is run through, through a company. And the shares are held by by Henry and his wife Patricia in, in equal shares. There's no shareholders agreement and there are just standard articles of association. So that's the background. But what's the the event that throws the family into turmoil? Well, as, as you will see from the, uh, the the family narrative that you've been sent, events turn on a particular evening uh, and, and the end of a rather rather turbulent dinner. Henry walks out of the dining room into the hall catches his foot in a in a rather ancient and mouldy lion skin rug, loses his ba balance, hits his head on the hard marble floor and wakes up in, in the hospital. His uh, wife and three children have, have, have kept um, an, an all night vigil around the bed, bedside. They've not been a, given a particularly positive prognosis, um, but he doesn't die of a brain hemorrhage. He regains consciousness after about three days. He's got impaired speech. He's a bit groggy but he is able to recognise his family. A day or so later, son Harvey, possibly drunk, certainly agitated, comes into the hospital, into the, into the hospital bedroom, ushers out the nurse and asks dad, has he made a will? Harvey, in some pain, shakes his head. So Henry, um, father in some pain, shakes his head. Son Harvey produces a, a dog-eared piece of paper, paper, says he's drafted a will for dad. We'll come to what that says in a moment and launches into a tirade about how rude and disrespectful his sister's been towards, towards dad. Henry, dad, nods towards the piece of paper, mumbles again, and then passes out. Wakes up a few minutes later to find son Henry, leant over him with the piece of paper in his hand. Are you happy with this, says son. There's a loud sigh from, from father. A nurse and a doctor look on. Son Harvey puts the pen in his father's hand, the wrong hand as it happens. The machine that goes ping goes haywire. Son helps father to put an X at the bottom of the will and the doctor and the, and the, and the nurse witness it. Father Henry is unconscious for the next few days and dies thinking about his mistress. And what he said, or what was said on the, on the piece of paper was this is my last will. My name is Henry Marmaduke Fitzalan Brook. I revoke all other wills that I may have made. I own Mortimer's Hall, Mortimer's Cross, Wentworthshire, which is my family seat and all the gardens surrounding it. My wife is called Patricia. My three children are called Harvey, James and Georgie. I also own about 3,000 acres of surrounding farmland and all the buildings on it. I run and own the farming business on the land, but my wife and I both own equally the tomato business. I also have cash in various bank and building societies and a substantial portfolio of, of investments, which I think are managed by Joshua Halfpenny and Sons, but I'm not sure about that. I think that's it, but whatever I missed off, Harvey can have. I want Patricia to have Mortimer's Hall and the Gardens, but when she dies, it must go to Harvey. Because he's my eldest child, Harvey should have all the farmland and cottages on it, but he should be kind to his brother if his brother wants to live and work on one of them. The boys can split whatever cash and investments I have. I'm not providing for Georgianne. 
I've given her so much and she seems so rude and ungrateful for that. She can make her own way with her chap, Stuart. Signed, Cross, and witnessed by Senior Registrar Gordon and Dr Connor Graham. And I think the question really with that is, uh, is, is what happens in this circumstance? The family is thrown into turmoil. And what happens if we, we fail to plan properly? I'm going to hand over to, to James Laycock primarily and then to, to Kate Harris to, to, to discuss the, the mess and the turmoil the family may find themselves in. James, uh, thank you very much for that uh, introduction and thank you for all those taking uh, time out of their uh, uh, day to join us this morning. Kate, um, so I've had a look at this, Will, and um, as I'm sure you have, and at first blush, it does strike me as potentially throwing up some issues uh, for the family, which if not resolved, um, could uh, escalate. I suppose uh, thinking about the background narrative and how the will came into being, do you think there's any argument um, to say that Henry didn't have sufficient capacity to make this will? Well, yes, James, I think absolutely there's a very um, significant possibility that Henry did lack testamentary capacity um, when the will was made. Um, now, as, as some people may know, the test for testamentary capacity is derived from a, a 19th century case which still holds good today. And there are, there are four elements or limbs to that test. Um, and Henry is going to need to satisfy all of those limbs in order for the will to be valid. Now, the, the first three parts of that test will require Henry to have <clears throat> understood that he was making a will and what that actually means, to have understood the extent of the property he's disposing of, and also to have understood the appreciated the claims which others may have on his estate. And finally, and perhaps the one which, which comes up most and which people will think of when they think of testamentary capacity is that Henry mustn't have been suffering from any disorder of the mind or insane delusion which prevented him from, from exercising his natural faculties and from making a will in, in the terms which he otherwise would have done. And you know, as, as James has, has mentioned already, um, there Henry obviously suffered quite a significant trauma. His prognosis wasn't good. We know that he is now experiencing um, quite a lot of confusion, quite a lot of pain. Um, it's clear from, from the will that's being produced that there isn't um, a full appreciation of, of the assets in the estate. Um, which he, he doesn't pick up on when it's read to him. So, yes, I think there, there seems to be serious cause for concern that Henry might not be able to satisfy the Banks versus Goodfellow test. Um, and I think even more so that we know that his estate is quite complex and that will in itself have required quite a high level of understanding from Henry in order to make a valid will. Yes, uh, absolutely. And I suppose if, if they were in a hospital and Harvey was by his bedside, um, uh, in order to try and uh, protect this issue, as it were, Harvey could have found a doctor to assess capacity at the bedside. Um, he had that opportunity. Would, would that have been uh, sensible, do you think? Yeah, it's a, re it's a really good point. Um, I think it would have been a very sensible idea. Um, the, the courts and case law show us that in, in circumstances where you have a, an infirm or an, an aged testator, there is a very strong recommendation that, the, that a, an assessment of capacity is obtained before the will is executed. Now, that's not a touchstone of validity. So if you do that, it doesn't mean to say that that will is um, exempt from challenge, but it will certainly help if you have a if you have a report from a, a qualified doctor or specialist saying that the testator, in his or her opinion, had capacity when the will was made. 
Uh, okay. Um, and turning to how uh, Henry signed this will, or, or uh, apparently signed this will, I see that there's a cross uh, for his signature. Does that make uh, it invalid simply because he signed with a cross? No, it doesn't, which may be surprising to some people, but the the requirements of a valid will come from the, the Wills Act, Section 9 of that Act, and that section requires a will to be in writing and signed by the testator or by someone else in his presence and by his direction. The testator must also have intended to give effect to the will by his signature. Um, but the, the use of the word signature, that can extend to a cross or a mark. So as long as Henry satisfied the other elements of that section of the Wills Act, a cross will be fine. Um, and just to kind of add to that, the fact that, that Harvey helped Henry to, to add the cross, um, that also won't invalidate the will as long as Henry himself made a, a positive contribution to the signing process, which I think we'll see from the from the facts is questionable. Uh, OK, and, and also looking, I'm looking at clause 10 in particular, uh, Kate, of the will, I, I, and I know that he, he specifically says he's not going to provide for uh, for his daughter, and that may be because um, of, of what he's heard um, his son Harvey say say to him. Is there any argument, do you think, that uh, that Harvey has poisoned his father's mind? And if so, what 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 would that do to the will or that clause? Yeah, I think there, there may well be, um, and it is possible to challenge a will on the basis of what we refer to as fraudulent calamity. Now that occurs when a third party, so in this case Harvey, makes false representations to the testator, so to Henry, which have the effect of, of poisoning Henry's mind against someone who would otherwise be a natural beneficiary of his estate. So I think we can all agree that George, Georgie as his daughter, you know, that we would expect her to receive something after he dies. Um, an important thing to remember, though, in order to invalidate the will, we would it would need to be shown that when Harvey was making those representations, he either knew those they were false or he didn't care whether they were whether they were true or false. So if if Harvey genuinely believes that he is telling the truth about his sister, even if the statements are in fact objectively untrue, the will won't be invalidated on the basis of fraudulent calamity. So it is quite a there's a fine line there and it will be very evidential, um, evidentially based. OK, um, so there are some problems that we can see. Is, are there any other pro problems that you can foresee um, in relation to the validity of the will uh, that people might pick up on? Such as, for example, I suppose, um, it's not clear whether the witnesses actually saw Henry add, add the cross um, fr from the narrative. Do you think that might pose a problem? Yeah, no, I, th I think it definitely could. Um, as you say, I think there we'd be looking at whether the, there was due execution of the will. Um, and yet, yeah, as you say, there was a, a, a one of the hospital machines went a bit haywire when just before Henry signed, one of the witnesses looked away. So there may be doubt there as to whether the witnesses actually saw Henry signing or putting his cross on, on the will. Um, another concern is that um, we're told that Henry fell asleep straight after the cross had been made. So he wasn't actually conscious when the witnesses attested to the execution of the will, which again is going to be a problem. Um, uh, we also we don't have a what, what's known as an attestation clause in the will, which is a standard clause that you will normally find, which confirms that the, the proper formalities have been followed. So that's going to be a, an, another problem that we might face. And I think finally, just to, to go back slightly to the, the, the ground of fraudulent calamity, another ground that's very closely linked with that is the possibility of challenge, challenging the will on the ground of, of undue influence, which will be essentially if it can be shown that, that Harvey 
coerced Henry into making the will to the extent that Henry's Henry's free will, his judgment, have been been overborne. Um, so that it's not necessarily an easy an easy ground to establish, but I think it's one one that you would expect to be raised on this set of facts. OK, thanks, Kate. Um, I guess now we, we uh, I just want to have a, a quick chat about the um, the, the other family, um, Kitty Longfling. And I can see that neither Kitty or Marshall, her son, are provided for in this uh, will. Um, th does that mean that they can't benefit in any way from this estate? Is there anything that they can do, do you think? Yeah, absolutely, they can. And this is a scenario that we come across um, frequently, um, the, you know, the, the idea of a, a hidden, a second family. Um, and there is a, a piece of legislation called the Inheritance Provision for Family Independence Act 1975, which is specifically designed to provide for um, claimants within a, within a defined class who have not been adequately provided for after a death. And that piece of legislation allows, as I say, certain eligible claimants to make a claim for reasonable financial provision from the estate. Um, and both Kitty and Marshall, I think, are potential claimants here. Marshall, as child of Henry, will automatically be, be eligible to bring a claim. And I think Kitty is very likely to be eligible based on the fact that Henry was maintaining her or appears to have been maintaining her before his death. So yes, I think that there is significant potential for both of them to, to bring a claim against the estate. And I suppose practically then, Marshall being a child, I mean, who, who, would, who would deal with his claim if he was to bring one? Yeah, no, so you're absolutely right. So because he is under the age of 18, because he is not an adult, it will be necessary to appoint <clears throat> someone to to act on his behalf, to provide instructions um, and to, to progress any claim that he is going to bring um, in his best interests. Now that the technical term for that person is a, a litigation friend and it, it can be a, a parent, a family member, a friend or even a professional. Now, in cases involving children, it is generally um, a parent who is appointed. But I think in, in this scenario, that's not going to be appropriate simply because if both Kitty and Marshall are bringing provision claims against the estate, there is obviously potential for conflict between those two claims. Um, as you know, we have a limited pot being the estate um, from which both those claims are going to need to be satisfied. So. And obviously other parent Henry is not around to act as that litigation friend. So we will need to find uh, an alternative who, as I say, could, could be any adult, really, as long as they are deemed suitable and are able to act in, in Marshall's best interests in relation to that claim. OK, that makes sense. Uh, is there anyone else in your view who might have a potential claim for further further provision from 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 the estate? Yes, I think there are there are two people that immediately jump out as the obvious um, potential claimants, and those are Patricia, um, so Henry's wife. And I say that because the the terms of the will, which we which we have, arguably does not make um, sufficient provision for her. It's, it's not clear whether she receives anything outright from the estate or whether she simply receives a life interest in some land and and a house. So it, it may be, especially as as the spouse, um, it, it may be that there is a quite a strong claim for provision there, subject, of course, to various other considerations which will need to be taken into account. The other person is, is Georgie, because as, as we've been told, she receives nothing under the will. Um, and as I said, as a child, she is a she is an eligible claimant, um, although arguably possibly um, her claim may be weaker than, say, Marshall, for example, as she is an adult. And so it will depend on her her ability to support herself, her her own income, her own financial position. But I think Patricia and Georgie are the, the obvious people that could bring a provision claim. Thanks, Kate. Um, 
the other thing that um, I think we would probably need to touch on is the makeup of the estate and the assets of the estate. And as you and I have sometimes uh, seen in previous cases, um, it, it's not always clear immediately who owns the assets, um, particularly if they have been um, uh, acquired and held for a long period of time. Over the mists of time, um, the, the ownership can sometimes become a bit blurred, as I think may be the case in this scenario. Um, what issues can you uh, immediately see that need that will need ironing out um, for the purposes of um, resolving things? Uh, and I suspect re um, ironing out before anybody can uh, make a, a claim against the estate. Yeah, absolutely. I think you've, you've hit the nail on the head there. So we have we are, we're told that there, there is this unwritten partnership of which um, the three farms, the plant and machinery have have formed part of that partnership but then we are told that they are the, the land is still registered in the sole name of Henry at the land registry so we have an immediate um, kind of contradiction there which is going to have to be to be resolved and um, as you say that the, the way to do that is going to be by examining the partnership accounts by carrying out a, a forensic analysis if you like of of the history of that land what 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 was intended, what has been, how it has been um, dealt with over the over the years leading up to Henry's death. So that that's going to have to be resolved. Another issue um, that, that that we know, we are told that Henry has a, a pension pot of just shy of two million pounds. Now, pension funds generally do not fall in the estate, um, and so they will pass either in accordance with a nomination which Henry may have made before his death or with, in accordance with the, the decision of the, the trustees of that pension fund. So it's going to need to be identified who is going to be the recipient of those pension funds. It may be one person, it may be spread over a class of people, but that, that's going to have a significant impact on the, not only, um, well, on, on the merits of, of any possible provision claims against the estate because as you'll appreciate if for example Patricia is the sole recipient of that two million pounds that is going to give her a, a quite a nice lump sum in her own name which in turn may limit the the merit of her provision claim and then just leading on we also obviously have have the limited company um, which again is, is going to, to throw up some some issues, um, which which I know James you've dealt with with quite a lot. Yeah, I mean the thing with limited companies, um, you, you look for um, really um, the, the governing documents, the, the constitutional documents. So uh, what do the articles of association say, and what do the what does the shareholders agreement, if there is one, say? And, uh, in respect of uh, events of death and transmission of shares, because um, uh, what the estate doesn't want to find itself in is is in a position of deadlock if there is a breakdown in relationships in the family, um, and resolving that deadlock is is sometimes tricky if there is no underlying mechanism um, prescribed by those documents which help helps uh, helps the family resolve things. Um, on occasion, you and you and I have also encountered scenarios where it's appropriate to look for limited grants. Um, and clearly, um, a discussion on this scenario would be, well, who's the appropriate person to go for a limited grant? But the, the benefit of a limited grant is to address and protect um, assets uh, and deal with certain assets um, that, that, that require immediate attention whilst other issues are getting are getting resolved and I think Andrew um, is going to maybe touch on that a bit later. The one final thing I just wanted to um, talk to you about uh, Kate is Jamie's position um, so we know that um, Jamie um, has worked on one of the farms I think uh, throughout most if not all of his adult life um, at for little or, or no reward and I think he what, whatever he has been paid he's ploughed into renovating the farm cottage um, in which he in which he lives um, it's conceivable I suppose isn't it that, that Jamie when he uh, sees his father's will could be a little bit aggrieved in, insofar as it, it doesn't appear to cater um, for him 
What, what if anything, can, can he do about that? Yeah, and I think you're, you're absolutely right to pick that up. And the, it, it's one of these claims that we're seeing more and more in, um, in farming, in the context of, of farming, farming families. We see, you know, they, they turn up in newspapers a lot now and the, the number of cases are, are increasing. And they, 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 it's a claim in what's called proprietary estoppel which is a claim which is based on promises or assurances which are made um, to which create an expectation on the, the claimant's part. So in, the, in this case, in, on James's part, that one day he would become entitled to the farm and the dairy herd in his own name so that they would pass to him. So in order to, to succeed in a, in a proprietary estoppel claim, James is going to have to show that those promises or assurances were made to him by Henry and that they were sufficiently clear to identify what he was being promised. Um, and then he's, he's going to have to show that he relied on those promises um, to his detriment. So as you say, we're, we're told that he's, he's worked on the farm for 10 years or so, that he spent the limited income he received on, on renovating the cottage. And he's also de declined other work from neighbouring farms, which potentially could have been profitable, could have given him other prospects. Um, so that that's all going to be in support of his claim. But it's, it's also obviously going to be relevant that James has received a, a countervailing benefit from from having rent free accommodation on the farm. And he did, we are told, receive some income for his work. So that, again, will be will be a benefit that he's had. The other thing that I think we need to think about is that um, proprietary estoppel is an equitable remedy. And so it's very important that James is able to demonstrate that he's coming to the claim with what's called clean hands. So if he, as a partner um, within this the, the family partnership has been signing off partnership accounts over the years, which include the farm and the dairy herd as partnership assets, then that may prevent him, so may stop him, if you like, from running a different argument now. So from asserting now that, that the farm and that dairy herd belong to him. Um, and I think as we both know, these sorts of claims are they will all turn on the evidence on the facts um they are incredibly evidence heavy so it's it will that they're, they're very hard to predict what the outcome may be so it, it will be a case of james putting his his best arguments forward and and seeing seeing where he got to um on on those key elements yeah, thanks, Kate. Um, uh, so, well, that's interesting uh, to know that James has a, or Jamie has a, um, a, a potential claim. Before I pass back to uh, James and Andrew, um, I mean, I guess this scenario uh, throws up lots of different issues, which unfortunately this family is going to have to grapple with, some of which we've, we've had a chance to just touch on you and I, um, but I think there are uh, a, a whole raft of other matters which in due course would no, no doubt bubble to the surface and have to be addressed. But for me, I think what the scenario underlines is that um, ideally um, this family could have had a, a, a bank of a protection, um, which I know Andrew is going to touch on, um, in terms of documents uh, that could protect it both as a family, but also in relation to the, to the businesses. So in relation to the families, we're talking about wills, correctly drafted wills, of course, and possible powers of attorney where they're appropriate um, and um, with other generational issues, cohabitation agreements and um, prenuptial, postnuptial agreements. So these banks of documents help protect and secure um, this family and uh, um, uh, families in general, but could have helped in this scenario as well, I guess. And on the family uh, and on the business side, then there are those sort of key constitutional documents as well, the shareholders agreements, direct to service agreements, partnership um, agreements, um, and making sure the articles of association deal with um, um, sad um, uh, events like this. And it's those banks of documents that um, I, I suppose had this family invested a little time um, in making sure was, was there, 
it would have uh, helped uh, to protect their future as a family, their cohesion, their harmony, and obviously the su continued success of the businesses. But thanks very much, um, uh, uh, Kate. That's um, that was really helpful, and, and I think what I'll do now is I uh, I'll pass back over to to James and Andrew. James, Kate, thanks very much in, indeed. I mean, the question then is is how, how do we plan uh, on the basis that prevention is is definitely better than better than cure, and certainly better than cure by litigation. Um, Andrew, we're going to talk about some technicalities, um, but also I think I think we've got a largely professional audience. I, th I think I think the, the 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 key insights here are probably you know the matters of judgment. You've been you've been do, you know, do, doing doing the job. I'm a I'm a simple property lawyer, and I'll ask some naive questions. But you've been doing this job for for the best part of twenty years. What you know? What is your professional judgment in the, in the circumstances to to, to navigate um, these these difficulties? And I think probably the sensible place to to start is the will. I mean, I, I can I can see. Um, I'm sure everyone can see that it's it's uh, it's not beautiful. Um, it doesn't even list ex or name executors and, and, and trustees. But I mean, take us through how that could be, how, how that should have been done, how that could have been improved. Yeah, well, and I think uh, in an ideal world with a bit of preparation and forethought um, and taking advice, one can try as best one can to avoid a lot of the problems that are thrown up in this scenario um, and try to preempt some of the disputes. One can't always stop people from falling out. One can't always defeat human nature and, and deal with sibling rivalry that has sort of arisen since the age of three or four. Um, but one can try to create um, an estate that uh, provides for everyone's needs and, and creates what is not just perceived by the, the deceased, but by their heirs as, as being fair, um, and that doesn't always mean equality, but 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 doing something that that, that you know will keep everyone happy and, and provide for them. Um, you quite rightly mentioned that, that the lack of executors and trustees here is is a particular issue. That there are all sorts of reasons why this sort of will might or might not be valid, but um, you know it's arguable, and, and one doesn't really want that argument to arise in the first place. Um, a will won't fail for lack of executors and trustees um, it, but in this situation we have a very un unfortunate position where it could create a race between conflicted beneficiaries to obtain a grant um, and so it might be that uh, interposing some professional administrators in the meantime which could be done with a court application um, would help to sort of enable the estate to be administered and keep things running while those sort of disputes are, are sorted out and resolved. Um, so that uh, that's definitely worth considering. But but in order to preempt that situation uh, and not allow it to arise, the ideal would be to choose a mix of beneficiary, a mix of executors and trustees who bring different skills to it, who aren't inherently conflicted. And that might be a mix of friends and relatives and professionals um, or trust corporations. Um, and that can still be done even with a deathbed will um, where it's urgent and, and one needs to have a, an urgent capacity assessment and things like that. So uh, just because the estate is complex doesn't mean that one can't put something in place urgently, but obviously the, the, the more time one has to plan, the better. No, Andrew, thank you. I mean, the, I, I think let, let's, let's just quickly before we, we pass on to, to, to Patricia and, and really the lack of provision for her. I mean, one, one practical concern, which I think you and I have, have seen wreak havoc in practice is, is not, not the, the very stark situation here where there is absolutely no one. I mean, most, most, most wills are not quite this incompetent, um, but actually think of one professional friend of ours who found himself as, as one of two, two executors and, and will trustees. The other was uh, was the was the widow, aged ninety odd, um, running a two and a half thousand acre farm. Um, you know, there was the usual prof you know, professional charging provision, um, but actually, what I think had been a uh, you know a, a gesture of goodwill to a, to, a, to a, a friend a generation older, um, you know, that he, he would be happy to act as executor came back to, to to bite in terms of just just taking up sheer time to run a run a big farming business. He was a land agent. He was better equipped. Than, 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 than you know than I would be, um, but he, he he nevertheless had to do that, and then suddenly in comes litigation um, from from the disgruntled widow, aged ninety. So not only managing 
the farm on a day-to-day -day basis, but also uh, also in it managing litigation, um, which is funded funded by the farm, whilst trying to actually keep his practice going. And, and I think that's that was quite a salutary lesson to me in terms of in terms of of, of, of you know a good deed not going unpunished mm. in in that respect. And just coming back to the to, to, to the deathbed will, I mean, in certain circumstances, as you've said, it's 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 a necessity or it's it's a, it's 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 a desirable and, and that shouldn't be put off. But I mean, in terms of that tension between um, on the one hand, uh, getting one's affairs in good order and on the other hand, finding oneself in extremis with with affairs out of order. I mean, can, it, 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 have you done it? Can it be done? Do deathbed wills wills work it? And, and and actually, what are what are the what are the practical circumstances around it? Practical circumstances are, uh, as we had in this situation, someone in hospital, you know, potentially or or at home uh, with a serious illness. You know, capacity may very well be in question, and one one needs to have a, an independent capacity assessment, um, which isn't necessarily best done by the GP. Um, there are specialist testament uh, capacity assessors out there and um, it's something that we we do as part of our role professionally as well but, but, but there are specialists who deal with nothing but and have the medical experience um, and that can help to prevent challenges on the basis of technical validity of the will um, in terms of the substantive terms of the will it, it isn't always possible to pin down every last bit of detail and get every single thing right and sometimes uh, you know, one needs to look at the options of including flexibility uh, in the will and leaving certain decisions in the hands of executors and trustees uh, to the extent that the deceased isn't able to rationalise and, and finalise everything during their lifetime. Um, it may be that, you know, mental capacity intervenes before they die and, and there might be all sorts of changes of events which they would want to take into account and they can give their executors and trustees the flexibility to do that. To varying degrees. Um, so again, that comes back to choice of executors and trustees as being crucial, um, avoiding those conflicts of interest. But but there there are there are certainly steps that one can take. And and in terms of the, those clients who aren't on their deathbed, um, don't let the council of perfection put you off from a solution which is good enough for now, and that one can tweak and improve later on with a codicil or a revised will, supplementary letters of wishes, and those kinds of things. And Andrew, and, and, and turning to the p position of, of, of Patricia, the, the widow, Hen Henry has left her not very well provided for at all in terms of, of, sort of testamentary wishes and provisions. I mean, what, what could have been done to improve her lot, to make her position more secure? Um, at face value, her only asset appears to be the tomato land. Um, and we don't know what else she might have. She, she may benefit from the pension. Um, you know, th th there are lots of things that one could do. Lifetime giving, as between husbands and wives, is is a pretty neutral event for IHT and CGT purposes, um, and so uh, that is certainly an option that one would have considered um, to make it take advantage, equalise their estates, and, and not bank on one of them dying first. Um, there's an attempt by Henry in the will to create a life interest for Patricia over Mortimer's Hall query whether that is actually sufficiently clear to be given effect and whether that would protect her in the way that he seems to have intended. Um, it certainly doesn't include any flexibility and it doesn't include any administrative powers in the will, which might one might you know, normally hope to include. Um, one can in those situations uh, use spouse exemption as a tool um, to minimise the inheritance tax and give trustees overriding powers um, so that they can also provide for other beneficiaries. Um, and that's not just about taking assets out of the hands of, of a beneficiary for, for bad reasons. It can be a very useful tool. Um, for example, if uh, Patricia was to lose capacity later on and be unable to make a gift, the trustees can terminate her life interest to the extent that she doesn't need assets. So there are lots of ways that one could protect her and provide for her long term needs and then as it becomes apparent that she's adequately provided for, one could start stripping things away and, and divesting her of value from her estate and, and passing it on to the next generations during her lifetime. Um, and so, yeah, the, 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 a combination of lifetime giving and uh, provision in the will uh, would be a, a sensible combination. 
And coming on to the, the wider estate and the wider piece in terms of, of IHT planning for, for succession, I mean, it's, it's, it's long been a given that everyone wants to sort of make maximum use of, of, of agricultural property relief, but equally with an eye to the fact that actually it may be abolished every time a, you know, a, a Labour government, for example, is, is, is talked about as, as coming into power. Um, but actually, you know, now we've got a we've got a government who has a which has a sort of a significant new demographic demographic in its in its electoral base, and we've got a chancellor who will fairly quickly need to to raise a very substantial amount of money. I mean, is that preying on your mind? Is that making the emphasis on on trying to make sure that BPR is is available, business property relief is available, all the greater? Yes, I, th I think it's it's brought those thoughts very much to the fore. Um, they're always prominent in one's mind, but I think they're particularly prominent now. Um, we are faced with a government which is going to have to find money like no government has had to find before. So uh, the balance to be struck between uh, borrowing and uh, you know, is issuing government stocks and, and taxation is going to be an extremely delicate one, but one is I think it's inevitable that we're going to see higher taxation in some form or another. Um, and so it, I think one obviously wants to try to optimise the reliefs as we understand them now. Um, in this context, there are clearly things that could have been done with the ownership of the estate uh, to improve the inheritance tax position. Um, uh, one wouldn't uh, allow the sort of the tax tail to wag the dog ever, but it's, it's always a relevant consideration. There are lots of reliefs here that we could seek to optimise. We've got at face value the availability of agricultural property relief um, on the in-hand sort of land which is farmed by the partnership. Um, a lot of that should attract APR at 100%, but only on the agricultural value. And there might be hope value built up in there that one would want to bolster with protection of business property relief. Um, uh, the, as I say, the spouse exemption could be used to the extent that Henry hasn't divested himself of non-relievable assets um, uh, during his lifetime, and those assets could then be passed on by Patricia um, in the hope of surviving seven years, um, so that a, a charge, you know, for example, the farm cottages, if they weren't of a character appropriate or one couldn't get full relief on other assets, um, also looking at, you know, the substantial value that's sitting in the, the investment portfolio, uh, it might be that those non-relieved assets would be ones that one would seek to benefit of the spouse exemption and then redirect as quickly as possible uh, once one's satisfied that Patricia is adequately provided for um, and, and hope that she survives the seven year period. Um, one can include more flexible structures within a will which enable relievable and non-relievable assets to be swapped between funds of a will trust um, and that can be a very useful way of, of not relying on the input of the surviving spouse again, potentially for reasons of mental capacity, enabling trustees to redirect things um, and, and to, if you like, shuffle the estate's uh, assets to make best use of uh, the taxable reliefs, uh, tax reliefs available within the anti-avoidance framework that we all live in. And we're told it's it's a it's a historic house. We don't know whether there are there's a stubs hanging over the over the fireplace in the drawing room. But but actually, you know, what about conditional exemption? How 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 comfortable should should people feel in relying on that? And what sort of what sort of factors would you take into account to, to those who are who are considering that as a, a means of I suppose postponing IHT as as in, in it, well as indefinitely as it can be used to postpone it. Mm. Uh, it's definitely worth considering, along with all of the other reliefs, um, if, if it's a large house, um, you know, one's unlikely to find that it's a, a character appropriate, um, even for an estate of this size. Um, so APR isn't going to solve our problems. Um, similarly, business property relief may not help us either. Um, but conditional exemption is a particular regime for heritage assets where you know, both land and chattels um, have uh, historical significance or they have sort of architectural merit. Um, and so it would definitely be worth considering. Um, it, it, conditional exemption carries with it uh, a compliance burden for the estate going forwards, for the beneficiaries who inherit or for the trustees who manage it. Um, and that burden and cost has to be balanced with 
the payment of the tax and you know one can pay tax on real estate over spread it over 10 years and pay interest on that tax and that would be another way of sort of deciding that one wants to balance those different factors and, uh, and either decide to pay the tax but not have the ongoing compliance burden uh, versus buying into that burden and, and cost but not having to pay the tax so it's a trade-off between those factors and it's it, it, you know th there is no one size fits all of course but it, it would definitely be worth considering in this case We've been thinking a lot, a lot about, about you know, as, as, as a group here about, about business structures, particularly looking forward into the 2020s and thinking about the flux that is likely to, to, to occur, for example, within farming businesses with the change in subsidy regime. And, and that's going to you know, drive quite a lot of, of liquidity events if one's going to be candid about it. But I mean, just thinking, thinking about the partnership here, we've got a, 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 an 18 Partnership Act 1890 partnership at, at will, I think. There's no written partnership agreement, but I mean, what could have been done better without going down the LLP route or the limited company route? Um, partnership structure is a perfectly sensible structure and is still frequently used uh, among farming families. Um, not having a, a, any form of written partnership agreement does leave one dealing with 19th century law, which is very often no longer fit for purpose. Um, and doesn't always accord with what the family would, would really want and what they need to do in certain circumstances. In particular, we, we have the automatic dissolution of the partnership um, under that Act in the absence of a written agreement that provides an alternative. Um, so that's likely to be highly undesirable. Um, a well-drafted partnership agreement is going to enable one to deal with things like dispute resolution, to deal with sort of competing interests between sort of family members. Um, it's absolutely vital uh, for any estate. Uh, number one, as James has already said, get all those documents in place, make sure they, they do what you want them to do and, and don't just think we have the partnership agreement, we can put it in a drawer and forget about it because you need to make sure that it reflects the reality. You need to make sure that both, you know, if it's the articles of the company or it's the partnership agreement that you don't cre inadvertently create a binding contract for sale in the document, which immediately negates the availability of business property relief. Um, uh, because that can be a, a tremendous end goal. Um, it's vital to make sure that the business entities accounts, be it uh, the partnership or the company, reflect the reality of the documents and the re reflect the, the structure that is in place um, and not the other way around. It, 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 it's all very well saying that, you know, of course one needs the accounts to, to put forward um, the best possible tax structure, but if the underlying documents don't support that, the revenue won't accept it. The accounts can't sort of present a fiction that isn't supported by the documents, so everything has to hang together neatly. Um, and that's something that needs really sort of close attention and, and ongoing uh, liaison between the professionals and, uh, and, and the family. Um, that can create a real uphill struggle with the revenue. Um, with the partnership in particular, it would be worth considering including the farmland within the partnership because to the extent that one can't get APR on it, and as I say, there might be development value, hope value there, um, as it's outside the partnership, it's in Henry's personal ownership, it's only going to get benefit from a maximum of 50% business property relief. Whereas if it was a partnership asset, um, which the accounts we're told appear to say, but the ownership doesn't actually support and the underlying documentation doesn't support, um, one, one's only going to get that 50%, but if one puts it into the partnership, one could qualify for 100%. So that, that would clearly be helpful in this situation. We've been asked what happens to a will in the absence of appointed executors. And I, th I think you, you've answered that. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't fail for want of named executors and sort of and then will trustees in, in, in the will. But I mean, that, that practical issue, I mean, it's not just about um, you know, the executors suddenly finding themselves running a business, but it's also about the executors, I mean, very suddenly needing to have the ability to administer that business. I mean, if, if this is in hand farming, as we're told, for, for you know, the substantial part of, of three and a half thousand acres, I mean, what would you be doing to, to enable the administration of the estate to be sped up? It may well be that the partnership agreement enables the partners to do a lot of what they need to do to continue running the business. Um, so again, we come back to the, the need for a well-drafted partnership agreement, the, 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 avoiding the automatic dissolution of the partnership on death. Um, in addition to that, we would want a will that includes administrative powers for executors to engage in the deceased business uh, 
uh, and to provide them with sort of full flexibility and removal of statutory constraints as much as that's sensible. Um, and so a well-drafted will can also help with that. And the final string to that particular bow is that one can make a very urgent application to the court for something called a grant at college and a boner, to use the old language, which is a grant to protect and preserve the value of the estate and to prevent loss to the estate, which isn't a full grant of probate, as, as James L was referring to earlier, that's a, what's called a limited grant. Um, and that can be taken out quite urgently with a letter of credit from the revenue so that one doesn't have to pay tax up front. Um, and it uh, is helps to enable estates to keep things running, to sort of pay employees, to pay suppliers, and all those kinds of things that when one needs to wait, you know, for time to put together red book valuations of a large and complicated estate, it's helpful to have that sort of interim step in one's armory uh, if if one needs it. Um, so that's, 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 that would definitely be something to be worth considering. Just one thought which which does occur. I mean, if one goes back to the, the last open quotes, open quotes will, his quotes of, of Henry Fitz Allen Brooke, I mean, he clearly had an eye to primogeniture. We haven't been able to do strict settlements under the Settled Land Act since I think 1995 or thereabouts, which was very much about a, a very big sort of solid structure that was intended to to, to buttress, what well, buttress the idea of primogeniture. Um, you know, in, in, in many ways, but I mean, how can one draft to provide for that? I mean, I take it that there are there are plenty ways, plenty of ways in which you can still structure a will so that it, it, that it, it follows that way. Yes, you can. Um, it, it, the, the old primogeniture sort of way of doing things under the Settled Land Act, um, it, it really is 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 no different. <laughs> I say no different to life interest. It has a lot of the elements of a life interest, um, and, and that was one of the things that it was tended to provide. One could um, provide uh, the best way of doing it is with a, a, a trust in the will, which would enable that to happen. Um, I think you know, one of the key things when one's looking at the succession planning in advance is working out, um, you know, on a human level, what's the balance to be struck between the individual family members and this notion of the estate and quite often there's a tension between sort of which is most important um, and, and sometimes you know the, the, the estate can override that and, and one quite often looks at it in terms of what, what is the coherent business structure which is going to help to provide for all the beneficiaries. Um, so it, it's a question of looking at the situation of the family, looking at what the testator wants to achieve and putting in place the best structure to, to do that, which might include a, a trust in the will, but that, that certainly isn't the only way. And before we move on to, 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 the, to the, the questions we've, we've had fired at us, just spare a thought for, for, for Kitty and Marshall and the, and the second secret family, which is something I've only come across once in, in practice. I mean, the one thing that strikes me from, from looking through the scenario and thinking about it is that if 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 Henry was racked with with guilt about whether he should have done something in terms of recognizing this and acknowledging it and dealing with it, that actually it, it is quite difficult to deal with 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 any sort of giving. I mean, even even into vivos giving, you know, lifetime gifts without creating a paper trail. Um, I mean, just in terms of of, of you know, I mean, J James. Um, and uh, you know, can 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 talk to, to what might happen in terms of uh, in, in terms of challenge, but I think in terms of in terms of, of planning for that, I mean, is is your is really your only option, um, short of leaving a paper trail, Andrew, to to, to you know to actually make a, a an intervivo gift. I think there there are lots of scenarios that, that one uh, lots of solutions that one can look to. Um, what you know, one encounters second families in you know, the very open context of, of divorce and remarriage, um, but also in the situation that we face here. Um, and one can understand that, you know, e even with professional confidentiality, the, these topics are not always easy to broach and, uh, and they're particularly sensitive and personal. Um, but one can provide for beneficiaries through trusts in the will, and there are structures known as half secret or fully secret trusts, where in fact, the ultimate beneficiaries' identities aren't discoverable from a will which becomes a public document uh, at the point of probate. Um, 
so that those would be worth considering. There are things that could be done, for example, with the pension. Um, we're told that you know, Mar Marshall is is Henry's son. Uh, he's a blood relative, and so he he might well be included explicitly as one of the potential beneficiaries of the pension pot, but Kitty might not. So Henry might want to consider uh, including her as a nominee of the pension pot. Um, he could also look at writing a life policy, um, taking a life policy, writing it in trust, um, having separate trustees, possibly making Kitty a trustee of that policy, giving her a degree of autonomy and control. Um, and he could fund that with payments out of income. Uh, and, and so, yeah, th th there are lots of things that one could do. Um, to to help with that situation, it's it, it's you know it does exist and and, and actually it's worth confronting face on and, and as professionals that that's something I think we we you know one would encourage clients to do in that situation because it can help to avoid the obvious heartache and uh, and sort of psychological and financial cost of disputes afterwards if if we're you know, doing our best to provide adequately for the beneficiaries who might have a potential claim later. Um, but it's 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 not always easily broached, but there are solutions available. Mm. Andrew, Andrew, thank you. And I think that leads actually quite neatly on to, to, to one of one of only two questions we've had. And we've got about about another 15 minutes. So if, if people do want to, to to type in to any further questions, then please do so. But I mean, the question is, is do the experts feel that trustees and non executive directors where appropriate, should take a, a stronger position. I think I'm probably going to ask James L to, to, to address that. But I mean, I suppose my own experiences as a as a trustee and, and, and dealing with families, not in quite such a sense of turmoil as this, is that, that the starting premise is, is always that there's usually there's, there is a there is the balance to be struck between the strength of the position of the of the trustees and, and, and the way it's asserted and the strength of the position of the beneficiaries. Um, and actually the primary way to approach it is to try and maintain the balance. But sometimes the trustees have to be assertive, sometimes the beneficiaries do actually have to be assertive. But James L, what, what are your, your thoughts in response to that? Yeah, um, and the position of trustees um, can frequently be a difficult one. And certainly in, in our experience, in the uh, last few years, beneficiaries of trusts have become um, perhaps more vocal um, in terms of um, demanding information from the trustees about the trust, demanding financial information about the performance of the assets, and also trying to understand actually the, the scope of the beneficial interests. Um, uh, so we frequently see um, more uh, questions and challenges posed by beneficiaries, um, uh, which have to be grappled with by trustees. What they can't do is they can't ignore them and they have to deal with them, um, even if that is actually to shut those inquiries down. And um, always the starting point, and I was dealing with one yesterday, always the starting point is to uh, have, a, have clarity on the extent of any powers um, uh, and duties um, that the instrument through which the trustees derive their authority gives them. That's the starting point. Then to look at, obviously, any statutory uh, duties that are imposed on them, um, uh, because that will determine what they can and cannot do. Then um, you turn your attention to what uh, they are actually being asked to uh, do. And it is a difficult uh, uh, balancing position that James has uh, alluded to. Um, particularly in the case of uh, discretionary uh, trusts, where actually you have to consider the bank of beneficiaries if actually only you're getting um, pushback, how shall I say, from, from one beneficiary. It's a question of, well, what do I disclose? How do I disclose it? And if I do disclose something, how does that affect the other uh, uh, discretionary beneficiaries? Um, can I redact some of the information or should I not disclose it at all? And they are frequent, uh, frequent uh, um, scenarios that um, we're finding trustees um, are are faced with. Sometimes they have to adopt a very robust position in terms of particularly disclosure. Why should beneficiaries see trustee minutes? Why should they see uh, documents which are uh, confidential and pertinent to the discussions between the trustees? Because 
um, if as soon as you start disclosing those documents, you are opening yourself up to challenge and nobody would want to take the office of trusteeship in those circumstances. So um, often a robust uh, position adopted by the trustees is absolutely the most sensible uh, and prudent thing to do in the circumstances. But it is a careful analysis of what powers and duties do I have? What are the questions that are being posed to me? What, what's the issue that I have to deal with? Um, and how do I uh, how do I take into account all the interests of the beneficiaries um, in, in, the, in the circumstances, say, of a discretionary trust? James, I, I think probably um, to, to you again for, for, for this question, which has come in, is, is with the company shares, can you elaborate on the key documents which a majority shareholder might have in place to avoid the issues outlined? If, if Andrew's got thoughts afterwards, then, then I'll, I'll come to him. But James, what are your thoughts? Well, um, as, as always with um, companies, what, what you would like to see in place are articles of association that deal um, specifically with the uh, transmission of shares neatly, um, particularly if there are circumstances with the surviving shareholder, are, are there, is there a mechanism um, uh, whereby uh, there can be a transfer of the shares to the surviving shareholder? Is there a mechanism for the calculation of the price? Um, can the shares be acquired by the company? So in other words, can the estate shares, if appropriate, be um, are converted into liquid assets. Um, and sitting alongside that, ideally, you'd like to see a shareholders agreement which um, uh, is uh, fits neatly with uh, obviously the family scenario and the members of the company dealing with, amongst other things, um, that, that particular issue and particularly if the shares are, are not necessarily held equally or have different voting rights or are, as in many family uh, businesses, um, are alphabet shares carrying different dividend entitlement and different uh, voting uh, entitlement. So um, really in, in relation to, um, to uh, companies, what you don't want to find yourself in is, is in a position where there is um, effectively standard deadlock um, and uh, what happens to the board in, that, in those circumstances? Um, uh, you know, do do the articles and as they are permit, for example, surviving directors um, or a surviving director to appoint a another, which would then deprive the estate of having representation on the board. That's not necessarily what the estate wants to be in whilst ever the issues concerning the shares are being resolved. Representation on the board might be important in order to safeguard the estate's interest in the company. So um, in essence, uh, it, is those, it is those constitutional documents. Going further than that, then you're looking at things like direct to service contracts to, to ensure that there is clarity on the scope of the role of directors, remuneration, et cetera. All these issues, I think, can be governed properly by the bank of protective documents, which, which when done, gives uh, the, the family and the business um, clarity and security uh, in terms of knowing how they are going to operate and what happens in the eventu eventuality of the passing of a, a key founder or key business or key businessman or key personnel to that business. And someone's asked the very interesting question, what claim would Marshall, Jamie and the gaffer have if the estate was in Scotland? Uh, and I'm sorry to sorry to say that you've 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 asked asked solicitors who are who are licensed to practice in in England and Wales. Um, we're very happy to put you in the direction of, of of solicitors north of the border, but sadly that isn't one that we can we can give a give a view on. Coming on to, to, to COVID-19, somebody has asked the, the question, you know, what effect has that had in this in this particular context? Um, you know, I mean, what practical implications of, of COVID? And I know, Andrew, you've been having having fun dealing with unilateral disappointment and appointment of new trustees on quite a valuable trust with with anything from 
I think, real property, which is ecclesiastical, to, uh, to quite a substantial share portfolio. I mean, what have your experiences been of, of de dealing with that and everything that goes with that um, during lockdown? Uh, yeah, I think, you know, as, as with all businesses, the current situation has presented all sorts of challenges, um, financial and otherwise, uh, you know, looking at dealing with estate employees and all, the job retention scheme and health and safety implications of how one continues operating. Um, so th there is, uh, you know, an overwhelming amount for sort of trustees to grapple with and they have to make sure that they're exercising their duty of care and making the decisions that they are. Um, looking at financial matters, um, the fact that, you know, investment portfolios might have plummeted in value uh, doesn't necessarily mean you have trustees who are suddenly liable for those losses if they've got, uh, if they've complied with their statutory duties, if they if they've, can show that they've taken independent investment advice, um, if they've put in place a, a trustee investment mandate and trustee investment policy um, that balances the risks, um, you know, then they're not necessarily going to be found wanting just because of uh, investment performance. Um, when it comes to practical issues, uh, you know, equally one has questions of, of what one does with rental properties in the estate and, and looking at what positions one can take with tenants if they're looking for you know concessions on rent and those kinds of things. So the whole raft of management issues that trustees are having to grapple with at the moment. Um, when it comes to the example you were talking about of sort of a change of trustees in these circumstances, you know, one has to be sensible about dealing with you know, executing documents and those kinds of things and practical arrangements, signing deeds and multiple counterparts, not getting everyone together in person, trying to arrange for witnessing, you know, with social distancing um, and sticking within the rules. Um, and thankfully now we're, we're in a, sort of a slightly uh, sort of easier position with movement than we were three months ago um, when life was particularly testing and, and one was having to be quite imaginative. Um, there are a whole raft of, of challenges that trustees face um, and so what, you know, it's been a question of thinking on, on one's feet, uh, particularly so for the last three months. I'm conscious of time but I mean, two, two quick questions I have. I mean, firstly, Kate, I mean, if the will fails, will the rules of intestacy come into effect as, as night follows day? <clears throat> It will depend on whether there is a previous will in place. And I think we are told that there, there probably isn't, but we will obviously need to, to make sure that that is the case. Um, and there are various ways in which you can do that. There are certain um, will searches that you can do um, of, of local firms, of solicitors, etc. So the answer is, it, so if there is a previous will, then that will be the, the fallback position. If there isn't a previous will, then yes, the rules of intestacy will will come into play, and that is how the estate will be divided up. Okay, so thank you very much indeed. And I think the last question, given the time, is is could uh, a farm business tenancy agreement be used with the partnership and or the company farming businesses to mitigate the unrelievable value in the property assets, or would that in practice harm a, a BPR claim? Andrew? Uh, interesting question. Um, if one's focusing particularly on unrelievable value, um, even though it's within the FBT, one can't guarantee that one's necessarily going to sort of have relief on, on, on otherwise non-relievable assets. So one will need to look very carefully at the, at the context in which that structuring is being done. Um, and look a lot, look at that option alongside the options of lifetime giving and actually passing on the unrelievable assets. Um, not forgetting also that if one's looking back retrospectively, one might have options such as a deed of variation, uh, or post death variation, um, to redirect assets um, so that if they are unrelieved and passing to a, to a, to a non-exempt beneficiary, they in fact pass to an exempt beneficiary. So there are lots of things that one could do to try to maximise the reliefs with forward planning and retrospectively. Andrew, thank you. I think it's 12.15, so I, I think we'll draw matters to a, to a conclusion. I'd like to, to thank everyone. I'd like to thank the panellists, which gives me my Nicholas Parsons moment. I'd like to thank everybody here who's, who's worked behind the scenes to make today possible. I'd like to thank, thank you for giving up an hour and a quarter of your day to join us. 
if you've got further questions, if you wanted to talk to us, um, our contact details will appear on a slide in a moment, but uh, are also available in, in the pack and via the website. There's an extensive portal on the website for COVID-19 advice as we're all trying to see our way out of the current limbo and, and back to, to normalcy. And if you Google Owen Mitchell Coronavirus Hub, you will pick that up very quickly. And there will be follow up from um, this, this discussion and, and debate um, to you by, by email, as I promised at the start. And please watch this space for future webinars and, uh, and virtual roundtables. So thank you very much indeed and, uh, and goodbye.